Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the POCUS Certification Academy for today's POCUS BIAS webinar. My name is Daria and I'm the Global Learning Program Manager with POCUS Certification Academy and will be your webinar host today. The webinar is now beginning, so all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you may have throughout the webinar. Today's topic is an overview of chronic venous disease and our speaker is Dr. Keith Moore. Dr. Moore earned his medical degree at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. He is a board certified general surgeon who has specialized in performed venous procedures since 2012 and is currently practicing at the Center for Vene Restoration. Dr. Moore is diplomat of the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine, as well as the senior member of the American Venous and Lymphatic Society. Some of his other achievements include being on the board of directors of Lymphology Association of North America and board directors of Lighthouse Lymph uh, Lymphedema Network. Dr. Moore focuses on superficial venous disease, lymphedema, and wound, wound care. Welcome, Dr. Moore. We're so excited to have you today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So to start, is that is that? Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank all right. You. So uh, first of all, it's one of the most common conditions to affect mankind. <clears throat> one of three percent of the Western world will have severe venous problems at some point in their lives. Uh, Twenty or more have varicose veins. Six million have some degree of edema. An estimated one million have skin changes, and about five hundred thousand have venous ulcers at some point. And uh, venous disease has been recognized since antiquity. Uh, as mentioned by Hippocrates in the Ebers paper, which was some of the most uh, earliest descriptions of venous disease. For any Bible scholars, you can look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6. It mentions venous disease there. Uh, hepatic vein valve was first described in 1539 as being unidirectional uh, valves. And Fabricus is uh, described venous valve and locations in 1603. William Harvey, who was an anatomist in 1628, in his paper, uh, described uh, venous valves as well. And Hippocrates once stated, it is better not to stand in the case of an ulcer delay. Uh, Vericos vein was described also in Greek sculpture, and treatment was described in Arab literature. Uh, in particular, Roman soldiers would wrap their legs and didn't realize that they increased their uh, ability to move about and over long distances, um, which was a form of compression. And then linen and plaster wraps were used even before Christ. Uh, lace uh, boots were used by Charles II of England for, for his, uh, 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 for his uh, um, symptoms of uh, venous disease. Then the owner boots would be still used now for venous ulcer disease was started in 1676. Then we went off to elastic stockings that was start um, uh, when it would develop this uh, in the 20th century. Jobs was an architect and he realized that um, when he got to his pool, his legs felt better. And so then he designed the Job stockings that we still use today. Uh, till recently, surgical excision was a primary treatment, <clears throat> but this resulted in some in very large incisions and long rehabilitation times. Sclerotherapy was first described in 1884, and in liquid sclerotherapy and microphobectomy were considered standard of treatment in the 20th century. However, in the 21st century, endovascular ablation, formal sclerotherapy, non-thermal, non-tumescent ablation therapies are now primarily used. So, oh, pardon that uh, typo, but as far as the venous, venous system is concerned, it begins developing at three weeks gestation. Uh, veins above the heart drain into the superior vena cava, and those below drain into the inferior vena cava. The leg is basically two systems. You have a superficial system, which is outside the muscular apartment or the muscular fascia. Uh, however, they are surrounded by their own superficial fascia. And this includes the great saphenous, small saphenous veins, and the branches. Then you have the deep, which is inside the muscle compartment, 
And they're more primarily responsible for getting most of the blood out of the leg. And again, these are surrounded by deep fascia. These include the tibial, popliteal, <clears throat> and femoral veins, as well as the gastro, nemius, and soleus veins in the calf. Uh, deep and superficial veins, first of all, they also they join in the groin, and they also join in the perforated veins in the legs, um, which are primarily, uh, most of it, it occurs uh, below the knee. Both the superficial and the deep veins have one-way valves that keep one-way flow going forward. However, the common iliac veins and inferior vena to paper do not have valves. Purpose of the venous circulation is to return blood back to the heart for reoxygenation and recirculation. And they're also the capacitance vessels, which means it keeps primarily most of the blood is supplied in the, vest, in the venous system. You know, generally, the risk of cardiac output is about five liters a minute, and 60 to 80% of the blood volume does rely in the venous system. Um, basically, it's uh, moved about through the venous system by pressure gradients, the valves that we spoke of before central pump, which is the heart, and then the peripheral venous pump, which is primarily leg muscles. There's a few definitions. Um, chronic venous disease basically um, describes more, uh, morphological and functional abnormalities of the venous system of long duration, which manifest signs and symptoms. Chronic venous insufficiency it generally is, uh, is describing more advanced chronic venous disease. And basically what you're seeing with this is uh, abnormalities of the venous system producing edema, skin changes, or venous ulcers. Uh, just some little elementary stuff here. Venous signs, basically what the clinician sees. These are visual manifestations of venous disorders like telangiectasias, which are spider veins, varicose veins, leg edema, skin changes, and ulcers. What the patient describes is in the symptoms basically are tingling, aching, burning, pain, muscle cramps, restless legs, fatigue. They can be exacerbated by heat or dependency and also can be relieved with rest and or elevation. Pelvic congestion syndrome is one of a particular type of venous disease where chronic symptoms may include pain, uh, uh, pelvic pain, perennial heaviness, urgency, or migration post pain as well. And these may be associated with vulva, perineal, and or lower extremity varicose veins. So basically, um, venous reflux is retrograde venous flow, abnormal duration in any venous segment. It can be primary, meaning it was uh, or secondary or congenital. Primary meaning there's no direct um, outward cause. Secondary could be due something to a previous DVT or an injury or it could be congenital, meaning that there's an issue with um, uh, venous development, for, especially the, the valve, um, the valve uh, development. <laughs> venous valve incompetence, basically describing venous valve dysfunction resulting in retrograde venous flow of abnormal duration. So axial reflux is basically uninterrupted retrograde venous flow from groin to the, to the ankle. It could be superficial, including the superficial system, or it could be deep involving the deep system, or it could be combined. And that means basically it's including both superficial, deep, or the perforators. And the perforators, veins, connect the deep and superficial systems, as we said before. Uh, superficial femoral vein, more terminology, is now called the femoral vein. Uh, if you look at some of the old books, it's still called superficial femoral, but that is the femoral vein. The profunda femoral vein is called now the deep femoral vein. And this is important kind of to know because the terminology is for describing what your findings are on ultrasound is important without you know, having kind of a uniform way of, of communication. Uh, there was a time when uh, perforators were named by the person who discovered them, Bowie, Crockett, et cetera. But now they're primarily um, known by their uh, anatomic location, and the thigh <clears throat> versus the, the calf. There's also a famous vein called the Van Giacomini, 
which is basically the connection between the small sapiens vein and the great sapiens vein on the same leg, that's no longer uh, in vogue now. That's called the cranial extension vein. Uh, now, as far as anatomically specific to ultrasound, um, and this is kind of important to know when you're scanning or doing a, what we call a venous mapping, kind of understand um, what to look for and what abnormalities may be involved when you're doing a scan. Now, two thirds of the cases, small sapiens vein will join the popliteal vein near the knee. So that's most of the time. A third of the cases, small sapiens vein will join the other veins. Great sapiens vein is described by the deep veins of the thigh. The small sapiens vein originates from the lateral aspect of the foot and it passes posterior to the lateral malleolus. Uh, small sapiens vein again passes posterior lateral to the Achilles tendon. Um, the great sapiens vein passes anterior to the medial malleolus. The great sapiens vein originates on the medial aspect of the foot. And the great sapiens vein passes through the foramenal valley during the common femoral vein at the saphenal femoral junction. There's three, see three pelvic veins that drain into the GSV. Those include the superficial inferior epigastric, the super, superior external pudendal, and the superficial circumflex iliac. And in the superficial inferior epigastric is one in particular we're interested in that's what we're doing uh, venous procedure because that's one of the landmarks we use to uh, determine that we're not the catheters are not too far into the into the uh, space uh, being close to the common femoral. Uh, major tributaries that are often mistaken for the GSV. There's two above the knee. Those include the anterior accessory saphenous vein, which basically is going to be come off. Uh, lateral to the great saphenous, and then the posterior accessory saphenous vein, which generally was going to come off medial to that and go posterior. Then there's two below. You have the anterior and posterior arches. Um, these actually kind of form like a little fork. Uh, the anterior going anterior to the great, posterior going posterior to the great. Uh, anatomically, for us, a lot of times we will consider the posterior more important because uh, when we do things like injections or foaming, uh, square foam skill therapy, this tends to be the more uh, common uh, connection to the deep system. The five major deep veins of the leg, again, two above the knee, three below. Above the knee, you know, the femoral and popliteal. Um, the below is anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and perineal. Uh, you may notice that I didn't include the um, the fundus femoral, uh, it is on a, a, a deep vein in the thigh, but it doesn't have less impact on what we're doing here as far as uh, venous uh, evaluation of venous symptoms. This is just a quick uh, picture of uh, what I described before, how the great saphenous will go into the um, common fem to the, to the uh, femoral vein. And then it, at that time, it becomes the common femoral vein. You can kind of see where the, uh, the three branches are that they go into the um, into the uh, uh, the great saphenous before it goes into the uh, um, common to, to, to before it goes into the femoral vein becoming the common, and you just kind of get an idea where the valves are. Okay, this is uh, in the groin again. This is just another. Uh, a uh, picture of the, the branches, as you can see, you can see where the anterior accessory comes off of the great saphenous, the posterior accessory. Uh, again, we talked about the superficial epigastric and uh, just a bit a different uh, view of that, of that anatomical region. This is a picture of how the valves work. Uh, you can basically see uh, it's a spoke to conduct universe, uh, 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 one directional flow, and just kind of a simple uh, anatomical description with the annulus and the leaflets and how they're supposed to work normally. This is a, a and this is a good uh, shot of how varied the anatomy can be down in the uh, at the knee. Um, like I described before, most of the time you'll have the small saphenous going into the. Um, the uh, popliteal, but you can see there's going to be actually 
you can see where you can have it going into the uh, poplar teal and then have a branch. Um, let me start to move this up. Right. Uh, with a cranial extension, going from the small saffron, you can have that. You can actually have where the small saffron is not even connect with the with the uh, poplar teal at all. And it has a terminal extension, or we call a cranial extension. And you have, you have multiple branches that are going into the small saphenous, um, as opposed to going into the uh, popliteal before it goes into the small saphenous. Okay. So, yes, and uh, gastrocnemius complex drain into the popliteal veins. As you can see at the picture we just showed, uh, the anterior tibial vein drain the anterior foot, the posterior tibial drain the medial foot. And the perineal veins drains the lateral foot. Okay. So again, the pump of the uh, peripheral venous system serves two purposes. It's a reservoir to hold extra blood, which like I said, we hold between six and eight percent of the total blood volume. And also conduct it's a conduit to return blood to the circuitry system. The rate of venous return will modulate the cardiac output. So that means if the cardiac output increases, decreases then the venous return will increase. Uh, Saphenofemoral junction in that. Uh, so we just showed you a picture of the uh, valves earlier. The preterminal and terminal valves are located within the GSV. Um, okay. um, the suprasphenic and infrasphenic valves are located within the common femoral vein. So we, we saw those. Um, the gray saphenous vein will be medial again to the AASV on the ultrasound. And again, the PA the, uh, posterior excess will be medial and go posterior. Common femoral vein and inferior epigastric vein come off the external iliac vein. Vein wall anatomy. <clears throat> vein walls basically consist of three components. There's a collagen matrix that provides a supportive framework. And there's elastic fibers that afford a sensibility and smooth muscle that will control venous tone found in the three layers. So you have what's called longitudinal adventitia, which runs along the length way, which is on the outside of the vein. You have a circular media, and then the longitudinal intima. And that's just a picture of just the general comparison between um, with arteries and veins. You can see that the arteries wall is much thicker, uh, but the vein, but that gives the vein wall the uh, movability to stand. So again, like I said before, functional properties of veins are thin wall and extensible, unidirectional valves, and have a contractile wall due to smooth muscle components. So venous valve is styled. You have basically four components. You have the bicuspid leaflet. You have what's called the fibromuscular muscular hump in which they sit. What's called a terminal node, which is the space around that uh, whole complex and the annular ring, which is an extension now from the vein wall itself. I guess that's just another quick picture. You see the annulus. Um, I guess we can see that. That would be where the, uh, the bulb would be. Valve annulus has been implicated as the area for development of varicose veins as it gets weaker. Um, due to different stresses um, <clears throat> and the, the annulus becomes thinned out, then the, valve, the vein wall around it becomes thinned out. And also um, it causes bulging and, you get the, and, and, let, and the um, valve itself is, becomes non-functional and therefore you get varicosities. Uh, the predominant risk factor for development of primary varicose veins is genetic. And again, the reason why that is is because it basically the veins are under constant turbulence through the blood flow, and they had to be constantly repaired. And when those repair mechanisms break down on a genetic level, then you get the uh, the breakdown of the vein wall and the valve itself, and then you start to see uh, venous reflux disease. The anatomy of the saphenopopliteal junction varies as we saw before in the, in the uh, illustration. Uh, by and large, the small saphenous vein will go into the popliteal vein above the knee. Small saphenous vein empties into the popliteal vein above the knee, can uh, above the knee. 
The small sadness vein can turn to a cranial extension, like we said. The small sadness vein can also empty into the deep femoral vein, or as we call it now, the profunda femoral. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so factors affect the venous flow. You have intrinsic factors, which include uh, venous contraction, arterial flow, muscular venous pump, thoracic pressure, abdominal pressure, vein wall, elastic recoil, as well as the vein valve integrity, and extrinsic factors, which include gravity, atmospheric pressure, Centrifugal force and then external compression. Mechanisms of venous flow include primary force from the lower extremity muscular venous pump, which is the calf muscle. Veins empty in an anti-grade direction, secondary to muscle contraction, which is forward direction. Again, we require competent venous valves to re prevent reflux. And during the contraction, the valve, venous pressure and venous blood volume decrease. The veins refill passively during the relaxation phase. No valves are present again in the common iliac veins or the IVC. And then veins constrict and relax in response to circulatory demands. When the muscles are, uh, when muscles to the lower extremities contract, the perforator can. The perforator is communicating with the deep system closed, and uh, there's no condom flow to the deep system during contraction. Flow through the perforators to the deep system takes place during relaxation. And that's an important thing to know when you're doing it, when you're evaluating perforators with ultrasound. So basically, venous disease, chronic venous disease, especially valve dysfunction, leads to something called ambulatory venous hypertension. And what that basically means, again, chronic venous disease is, is equated with that. And this will occur when any other normal vein components are compromised, be it the muscle pump, be it the vein valves, or the vein walls. This causes inflammation by stimulating some of the uh, components of inflammation in the blood to become activated. And this affects the vein wall, causing dilatation, which leads to valvular insufficiency and reflux and also increases ambulatory hypertension as, as, go, as it goes, as well as uh, vein wall permeability. Pregnancy can also result, cause this and result in vein wall dilatation. Thrombosis can result in valvular insufficiency, but primarily, again, genetic factors that include the number of valves on each side, the vein wall composition, and the repair mechanism. Elevated venous pressure also causes elongation of the veins, causes torturosity and increasing vein wall permeability, which results in increased valvular incompetence, and eventually the valves over time would actually disappear. So as far as the levels of reflux, um, at the south node femoral junction reflux, if you have a junction, junction reflux, that will progress to the knee in about 40% of cases. If it, project, it will progress to the thigh in 30%, and it will go to the calf in 30. However, in the lower third of the GSV is normal and up to 97% with upper GSV reflux. And that's just because of the fact that chronic, venous disease is chronic disease, and not all the valves will fail at one time, but it kind of fails in that stepwise fashion over time. And that's also why sometimes people will have very few symptoms in the beginning, and they get worse as time goes on. As far as small valves, uh, uh, small sapness reflux is concerned, incompetence again and dilatation usually limited to the proximal third of the vein. So even with someone, people, it doesn't usually happen down in the distal third, and that's less associated with symptoms. Um, the great sapness vein reflux can also cause sapness vein reflux if they have a, if there's a cranial extension same way as it goes down to the calf. Otherwise, we would be called this name, the vein of Giacomini. When we do an ultrasound to determine if someone has reflux, basically we're going on vein closure times. And this is kind of a, uh, a basic so we use. If the valves stay open in the superficial veins more than 500 milliseconds or half a second, we recognize that as reflux. 
uh, deep veins is one second or a thousand milliseconds, and the perforators are um, uh, 0.35 seconds or 350 milliseconds. So for his diagnosis and symptoms, basically people, we talked about this a little before, patient will complain of things like achiness, cramping, uh, uh, night cramps, restless leg, swelling down to the ankle, uh, itching, burning, and that kind of thing. Uh, signs include skin changes, ulceration. There's something we call venous eczema, where there's actually engorbing of the, of the, of the, because of the cooling of the blood in the lower extremity. You get a lot of uh, uh, backflow into the, some of the superficial in the skin veins, so they get this kind of a blushing effect. Uh, there's something that's called lipodermatosclerosis, sclerosis, in which you get fibrosis of the subcutaneous in the skin. It usually happens over a long period of time. And then one thing we also look for something called atrophy blanche, which is basically atrophy with, of the skin and subcutaneous tissue with these punctate types of hyperpigmentation, which basically are um, thrombosed uh, superficial veins themselves. Um, diagnosis, basically we use continuous Doppler is probably the first thing we would consider if you had that available, but that's going to be very nonspecific and very operator dependent. But this mography basically measures volume changes in the limbs. Um, that is not widely used because it's a little bulky and it takes a lot of expert, expertise to kind of interpret that. Occasionally there's CT and MRI venogram we'll use. That's particularly, we'll use that up in, up in the pelvic areas places that our ultrasound is not as reliable. And then there's also what we call intravenous intravapid ultrasound where a catheter is introduced into the vein and we can actually visually see valves is also look for compression on the outside of the vein itself, particularly in the, in the pelvis. Of course, there's angiography venography, which involves dye injections. Uh, that's not used much except in very, uh, in very uh, special cases. So our primary use is going to be duplex ultrasound. And uh, just a couple of tips when you're using your ultrasound uh, on your B mode setting, you want to optimize the gain in the focal zone because uh, you want to get a, a lot of uh, lateral visualization to the op optimize. You want to use the highest frequency popper for the given depth, and you want to drop your PRV to the lowest you can drop it. Just so you want to see the slower flow rates. If it's too high, you won't pick up the uh, slow uh, evidence of reflux, like especially through perforators. This is just a, 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 a this, 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 this is a normal scan with, uh, and remember we, we do a um, augmentation of the leg with a patient standing. And you can see there is some artifact there on the distal part of the slide, but essentially um, that augmentation, you can see how it kind of goes down into a kind of a V formation. It does not come back above the baseline. So that's how we know after augmentation that this patient does not have reflux. Now, this is somebody who's obviously has reflux. You can see you can't on it. It's on part of the slide is cut off, but um, you can see that if you look way to your left, you can see that the primarily that the augmentation was before the augmentation, it was below the baseline. Um, and now it's over, it's entirely over the baseline. It's like this person has about looks like about five seconds of reflux. Um, now if you look uh, so if you look at the uh the color at the color flow, now we, we always use red for reflux and blue for normal, but you can actually flip that color bar over. And so you can't always depend on the color bar itself unless you set the machine up. So it could be uh, somebody may set up back the other way to where they see and reflux is blue and normal is red, but we generally use uh, reflux is red. And this is another uh, evidence of someone who has reflux. You can see before augmentation is primarily below the baseline. And then with augmentation, you see an above the baseline. So let's, let's talk about a second of reflux. So again, uh, pulse wave, spectral and color flow, you want to use that as you just saw, just to get a, a better a picture of what's going on. And um, you want to um, use five to 10 seconds, five to 10 sec centimeters second range with, with the lowest wall filter. And again, that's so you can see the slower, ref the slower, the slower uh, blood flows. So how to do the exam, 
Uh, it should be done standing with more weight on the non-examined leg. And basically, we're looking for vein size in, in the millimeters, uh, reflux, uh, of course, and then the location of the reflux, above the knee, below the knee, perforators in the deep, and then also, of course, the length of time of the reflux. Again, if you want to use color flow and augmentation, that just gives you a, augmentation is important to actually elicit the reflux and the color flow, even if just you just use the spectrum, I mean the just the uh, the baseline, the color flow just gives you a better picture and more more detail. So the incidence of uh, a presence of uh, the ASV reflux is about forty percent. And again, this is often mistaken for the GSV, but if you look at on cross examination anatomically. The AASV is usually directly above the femoral vein. And in any vein we consider outside of the sheet, we consider those tributaries. And uh, normal GSV between 3.5 and 5, through 4.5 millimeters. And normal uh, SSV is going to be less than three. So anything over that will consider somebody who may have some kind of chronic venous disease. Uh, now, treatment-wise, so started back with traditional vein stripping, which is rarely done anymore, primarily uh, because it's a long rehab time. Patients re require general anesthesia for that, and they're usually on some type of a inpatient morphine, a very heavy pain control. So that's what you see here in the West. Uh, so we primarily do now minimally invasive procedures, and we can divide those into what's called tumescent thermal ablation which regards a catheter generates a certain degree of heat. And uh, in particular, uh, we have what's called laser ablation, which is otherwise called EVLA. And, all, and this is what this uses is a laser fire with a particular wave, wavelength that is basically set to the wavelength of red, which is blood, which superheats the blood, which ablates the vein. Then we have what's called high radio frequency ablation, which uses a high radio frequency catheter to ablate the vein by direct contact. Now, there is uh, something called steam ablation, where high, uh, hyper, um, superheated steam is introduced to the vein, but that's generally not seen here in the U.S. Then we have what's called non-thermal, non-tumescent ablation. Basically, there's no, um, no heat involved, which means non-thermal, and tumescent anesthesia is what's used to insulate the vein. Uh, doing a procedure because since there's no heat involved, there's no need for um, uh, for the tumescent anesthesia. And at this point, with this, we have chemical ablation, which we have some, i.e. like verathena. And basically what this is, is a detergent sclerosis that can be introduced to the vein and it works by saponification, which destroys the vein wall and causes closure of the vein. Uh, there's something called venous here, which basically is like a cyroacrinate glue. It's introduced to a catheter and it actually closes the vein with injection along the length. And then we have something that's called Clarivane, which is a proprietary mechanism that where it actually uses uh, a mechanical and a chemical component. This is just a picture of um, this is a picture of what the uh, venous cell looks like. You can see it's got a handle with a catheter attached, and then that uh, material at the beginning, at the front, that's the glue. And this catheter is basically introduced into the vein and pulled back and over certain um, measurements, uh, a degree of glue introduced into the, um, into the vein and closes it off. This is the clear vein. You can see this is also a guy, it's got um, uh, what we call the polydocanol or the detergent sclerosa that is attached. This is injected as you pull, pull that catheter back. That catheter has a rotating hinge on it that stimulates the vein wall to get the vein to contract. And as you pull it back, it, you inject this, um, the, uh, the, uh, the chemical, and that causes vein closure as well. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time. I hope you learned something and got some, uh, something out of it. Uh, we do have a, a, sh a short video to uh, describe a procedure, um, and I uh, appreciate all your time. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for the video. Uh, give me one second. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready, Dr. Okay. 
Okay, so basically what we're doing here, we're doing a radio frequency ablation on a small saphenous vein, and so everything is already set up. Um, and this is typical. What we usually do is have the patients head up just a little bit. Um, we have we see we had an ultrasound set up and everything, so we're pretty much uh, just doing a little introduction to what we're doing here. So the first thing we're going to start, we're going to do is just evaluate the vein and. Uh, get an idea of, um, you know, how far, is, is there a cranial extension from the small saphenous? Does the small saphenous actually go into the popliteal above the knee, below the knee? And so that's be the first thing we're going to be doing on the video. Okay. Well, again, we're just, uh, I'm just scanning the leg, making sure, and a, a big part of it, you know, if you do enough scanning of veins, you can, you'll find that there's all kinds of variations, and they're not, they're, not, they're not always just straightforward, and, um, you know, with no little branches coming off, and we, we need a, a part of the, we need a vein that the catheter can't turn corners, so we basically need a, a, a straight vein, so we look for a good place to get, to get access. So now you found access. So what we're going right now is just um, doing this using the skin wheel lidocaine. Uh, using like a 31 gauge needle, but that's a lot more comfortable for the patient. And then we have an introducer, which is about a about a 16 gauge. And this is how we we do it over what's called cell dinger technique, which means that um, we use introducing all the catheter and introducer devices over a wire. And so he's going to see. Um, it's getting access to the small saphenous. Remember, we're not really we're not really too concerned about going down to the ankle um, because usually it's not usually like refluxing down there. So we see us getting access there. Okay, and we know we have. And you can see if you look real close, you can see a little flash of blood in there. So now um, we're introducing the wire. And uh, we usually have a lot of wire, more than we need, but we try to use the, get to put the wire all the way. Then we can shoot that the vein is patent and that the catheter won't be, uh, won't be interfered with when we're advancing it. So let's put a little bit more here. Um, and what we're going to be doing is something that like I said, we talked about when we use the catheter with heat, we have something called tumescent anesthesia. And basically what tumescent anesthesia is, is basically, uh, Anything lidocaine or any local anesthetic, they put in a lot of fluid. And uh, it was originally mainly used by plastic surgeons when they were doing um, liposuction. So they would just inject a lot of this lidocaine with a lot of saline. And maybe some people would use bicarb and uh, epinephrine. And that would just make everything nice and numb. And they would use the cannulas and then just suck out the fat. So I made it like nice. So we use it for uh, for here because it's we use that room temperature and um, it also acts as a heat sink and it removes some of the heat from the cath away from the surrounding tissue. So there's less damage. Uh, it also because it's cool it encourages vasoconstriction, so the vein will tighten around the catheter a little bit. And not to mention it's got lidocaine, so that's uh, keeps the keeps the patient from feeling the heat. This catheter generates about a temperature of about 120 degrees Celsius. So you want to be sure the patient is well numbed and well anesthetized before turning on the machine. Okay. So now we just want to advance in the catheter. And uh, we always pre market to be sure we're not too far. We don't want it anywhere near the uh, South and Old Hill Junction. We like it about maybe two, four centimeters from that. And that way we know we're not going to get any heat transfer into the deep system. Um, so we're just measuring that right here. Uh, like I said, this catheter generates a temperature about 120 degrees Celsius. 
and that heating element that's on the end of the catheters. The one we use today is about seven centimeters. They come, they do come in three centimeters. Um, but we have the three, the seven centimeters, we with the three centimeters for shorter segments. Uh, the seven centimeter we use uh, just for you know a regular you know, run-of-the-mill straight vein. And it's based on a timer. And so when we activate the catheter, it will activate in 20 second inter, uh, inter intervals. And each time that interval ends, we know we just move it down. There's measuring uh, marks on the catheter itself. So we know that um, we're not overlapping and we're getting a good energy transfer to all the segments of the vein. Uh, this portion, we just reposition the patient, uh, putting her head down just to empty the vein, and that just gives us a better contact with the wall, with the catheter. Okay, so um, here we're going. We're just making a few dots here. We're going to put our tamesin in. And we just do that. It's distributed over evenly. Um, make sure that all the vein is is uh, is covered by the tumescent. So we just kind of, and I'm just seeing him just tapping there, just do a little distraction, keep the patient from uh, feeling the sensation of the needle so much. <laughs> So if you watch close, you can kind of see we're putting it to messing in and it just kind of, uh, we try to put it all around the catheter itself and um, it's just kind of, uh, like I said, it's kind of an insulator for the catheter and the tissues around it. And you can see, of course, it's, you know, with the dark, you know, just, uh, you know everything, air and water look dark, so. Kind of getting that's just kind of what's um, we just kind of move it up and down. So we like I said, we're just trying to make sure everything is nice and and numbed up. Uh, we don't want anybody to feel 120 degrees Celsius of uh, 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 sensation, so uh, we kind of take a little extra time with this. And so now you want to look, and then you see that the temperature says 24 degrees Celsius. Originally, it was 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature. So we know by 24 uh, degrees Celsius, um, the, uh, it's well insulated. That's that's even less the room temperature. So you don't have to have it too cold, but we wanted to be able to see this obvious. Uh, that there's an obvious uh, temperature change. All right, so now we're going to start the ablation. And so basically what I'm doing here is we're just putting a little bit of pressure uh, over the catheter just to get bring get better contact with the wall itself. Of course, um, the reason why we're using like the little, uh, using like the little uh, roll there is that the, the, 
the heating, heat, the heating element is about seven centimeters. I kind of just measured that out, knowing that uh, that the probe is about four centimeters and that the uh, roll is 10, I can be 14 centimeters. So that means I can pretty much not have to move that uh, but a couple times before. I, um, and I know that there's no overlap. Again, we know there's no overlap in the um, in the uh, uh, in the application of the heat, but this being a small sapling vein doesn't really matter quite as much, just because it's uh, it's much shorter. So, okay. Okay, so that's the end of the procedure. Um, after that, we'll just um, I'll put a little, little stereo strip on there um, because we use a lot of the Tomessa anesthesia. After that, what we'll do is um, give patients some walking instructions, help walk some of that out. Uh, I think the wonderful thing about this, you know, the procedure we're doing now is that once upon a time, this was a hospitalization. I mean, people were in the hospital. It took general anesthesia. Um, they were in the hospital for a few days. And it's because of the, the, tra the traumatic nature of vein stripping. You know, people weren't really back to normal until, you know, maybe two or three weeks later. And at the same time, there was a lot more issues with, with nerve damage. So um, uh, technology's come a long way. And uh, I, think, I think that's why it's a, it's, it's a lot easier to take care of these patients now. And they're a lot more willing to do it. Because they use our time to get instant relief, and uh, and it's something they can just they can, they can come in, get it done, go home, go back to work, anything. So, all right, it's very good presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore, and sharing this video of the procedure. I think that was very helpful. Uh, we do have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to start from um, first question. Actually, I'm, uh, yes, we'll start with the questions and then we'll move into the quiz portion of the presentation. Uh, okay, first question is, uh, what are grayscale and color Doppler signs specific for calf muscle pump dysfunction oh you know i'm not really sure about that as far as what as far as um basically if you're looking at um if you're using the red i said we're using the scale like red or blue we use the red now you would have to actually have somebody ambulating to know if they have muscle comp dysfunction while ultrasigning them at the same time that'd be kind of tough to do just because you know you'd be have to walk with them with the pro now a more appropriate way to do that would probably be with a plethysmography, because then you can actually, because uh, they're because they're actually attached to the attached to the to the device, and you can maybe do augmentation or have them flex. They can, you can have them, you know, flex flex or uh, relax the muscles, and that'd probably be a better way to do it. Because doing it with an ultrasound, you'd actually have to have them, or I guess you could have them flex and extend them, but um, that's not going to really show you a whole lot about valve integrity. Thank you. Uh, next one is, uh, how common is pelvic congestion syndrome associated with lower limb venous insufficiency? Um, that's probably, you know, you can have uh, pelvic congestive syndrome without lower extremity venous disease because it starts from higher up. So it'd probably be maybe, I'd probably say between 20 and 40 percent, something around in there. But um, you can have that because remember the pelvic pelvic disease starts higher up, and it may not have progressed down far enough to where you're going to see down in the uh, lower extremity or not. Thank you. Uh, next one. I have a patient with a very prominent and large right jugular vein and very small left jugular vein. What could it be the cause? Is there something to be concerned about? 
Um, you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, I guess, you know, as long as they're not having any, I mean, because that, that's not, we, we don't really deal a whole lot with anything above the, above the navel because um, they don't, because of, because of gravity and different things, you don't really have that much of issues. But if the person is getting, is not having any, uh, I'd imagine the person's not having any neurological problems or any balance problems and, and, and flow is normal, they have they don't have any congestive uh, symptoms that it, it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. Thank you. Um, next one, is there any way to repair the uh, incompetent valve and dilation of uh, veins permanently? No, I mean, a lot of it is, there's a lot of experimentation going on as far as making valves, but yeah, the and they, people are trying it, but um, it hasn't really been effective enough to where it's something that's available on a wide scale, but it is in development. Okay. Um, we have a person asking um, about classical ultrasound features of vein of Giacomini, please. Okay. Uh, well, basically, it's just a, uh, what we call the cranial extension, it's just a connection of the great saphenous to the small. Um, you, can, you can find, and it could be, it could be either the, 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 pop, the, the, the small goes into the popliteal, but there's a branch leading from the small going into the great. Or it could be no connection to the popliteal at all and go straight into the uh, great sapphires. And in that case is when you can a lot of times see reflux in the small when it's in the great. Okay. Uh, next one is, we have performed these studies in the past while standing. When new vascular surgeons started a few years ago, they said laying down and using, I'm going to butcher this, exogitraverse, Trender and Burke, that's and the same Burke, thing. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I do know, I do know that um, some people do do that, some techs do that, and I think a lot of it's because they're trying to save the shoulder. You know, it's a matter of ergonomics and trying to just maintain. And I think you can still get, you can still find reflux, but if you have somebody who's, if you're, if you're just not getting reflux from that study, then you got to stand them up because you may not be getting enough um, gravitational force to actually see something. But it's always better to stand up. I mean, that's, that's, in the, that's, in, that's, in the, that's a test question. It's always better to stand them up, but I do understand what the person is asking. But yeah, I think a lot of the techs will do that just because they're just trying to save uh, ergonomically because it's being in that position over a long period of time. And you know, doing a Venus map, it may take 40, 45 minutes. And so you're trying to do that all day long and trying to just keep your shoulder and keep your arm to be able to work through the day. That can be a little difficult. But um, so I understand what they're asking. It's always better to stand. But I do get I, I don't I understand the question. Okay. Next one. How are you differentiating primary from congenital reflux? Uh, usually congenital is something you want to find as a child. It's not going to something they develop over time. Primary is going to be more like something as as it time go as they as they get older, and you start to get vein failure because of the, the, the when we say genetics, uh, we're meaning the valves were there, and then over time they fail, which is primary. Congenital means they probably have malformation of the venous system itself. They might not have a they might not have a superficial like in KTS, where. Uh, uh, a crippled trinalinate syndrome where they may have just the abnormality of the venous and the lymphatic system to where they get these uh, really uh, classic things. Uh, that would be congenital, something they would be born with, whereas primary would mean anything outside of like somebody who had a DVT, and then because of the DVT, they had valve destruction, and then that would be secondary, or somebody who had a trauma where they damaged the vascular, the venous system, and they had uh, reflux because of that. Something that, that would be the distinction. Thank you. For SSV reflux, your recommendation is to seek reflux in the proximal one-third of the vessel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, primarily because that's where, the, that's where you're going to find it the most. And that's also... Um, where uh, symptoms come from, we're not going to be using, you know, 
we're not going to be using uh, heat generating catheters down in the area of the um, say the Achilles tendon because that's the where the serial nerve is. So even if there was reflux down there, if you're using Evla laser, you're using RFA, you're not going. You're only going to go so far down onto the distal calf anyway because you because if it, that that serial nerve can actually get very intimately close to the SSV. And then if you if you damage that, they'll get neuropathy with which it's a it's a it's a sensory vein, so it's gonna be a lot of numbness. So now if you were using something that was not to mess and non-thermal, you could, but most of the time it's gonna be in the top third where you're gonna see symptoms. Okay. Uh, for cranial extension, where is the best location for augmentation? Um uh, the calf, up and down the calf. Okay. Uh, when do you use stripping and how? Thanks a lot. Oh, like I said, it's very rare anymore. Um, I have heard of some people still doing stripping in the cases that um, insurance won't cover the other procedures. But that's pretty rare. I think this, this particular guy was in a part of the country to where um, there was something funny going on with the reimbursement. So he would do stripping, but he still used some medicine anesthesia at the same time. He wasn't doing it in the general, but by and large, you rarely see it anymore because of what everything was available. And uh, concerning that, uh, regarding stripping, will sufficiency be achieved? If yes, will the condition reoccur? I'm sorry, repeat that again. Uh, regarding stripping, will sufficiency be achieved? If yes, will the condition reoccur? Well, it's a very really high recurrence rate with um, with stripping. Not necessarily they're going to have reflux again, but they develop neurovascularization to where once the vein is gone, the little pieces of the vein that's still left will kind of just grow haywire. And you have all these little superficial and some varicosities, which are just connected to the deep system. They're connected to uh, perforators. And uh, in that case, you can't re-ablate them because it's not a straight line. In that case, what we would do is just pretty much ultrasound guided foam fill therapy, which works good, but... That's one of the issues with stripping is that they get this neovascularization from the ends of the vein that was stripped. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the other procedures are so much better. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And last question, can we still use an insufficient GSV for a CABG surgery? Um, you can. Um, I think most cardiac surgeons these days will choose to use something else like you can use internal mammaries which are right along the entire of the sternal border. You just drop those down and plug them in their arteries. So they're going to do, they're going to have a lot better uh, a long-term patency rate. Or oh, a lot of guys will use uh, radio arteries because they're easy to harvest. And uh, as long as the ulnar vein's intact, you have a negative Allen sign, they'll use uh, radio arteries. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, the, the GSVs are still working, but if it's incompetent, that means there may be some um there may be some venous uh wall abnormality or some problem with the vein wall itself. And that might be an indication that uh the graft itself might not stay patent very long. So I think they would probably use that in like a last ditch effort. That's all they had. Thank you so much for sharing uh, this information, Dr. Moore. Uh we're gonna go ahead and uh, launch a couple of quizzes for you guys. Um, so first question is, uh, can you uh, tell us what is the number of population with venous reflux disease? You have options 40 million, 20 million, and 10 million. Uh, we'll give uh, maybe about uh, 35 questions to answer um, uh, this question. So about 25% of our audience responded to this. Um, Let's give another maybe 15 seconds. All right. And we're going to go ahead and end the poll, share the results. So correct answer is 40 million. We only had 15 people answer it correctly. Um, going to go ahead and Go into the next question. Mm 
Right. What is the most common cause of venous reflux disease? Obesity, genetic, lifestyle, trauma, and injury. This can be a tricky one, I feel like. Dr. Moore, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> but we have about 30% of the audience responded uh, to the question. So we'll give another 15 seconds. Here are the results. We have obesity, genetic lifestyle, trauma injury, and the correct answer, I believe, is uh, genetic and lifestyle, uh, which most of you guys answered correctly. And we have last question. How should wall filters be set for venous mapping? Lowest, highest, or mid range? All right, this one is popular. Okay, about 40% people responded, so we'll give another 10 seconds. Okay, and here are the results. So I believe the correct answer is the lowest. Is that right, Dr. Moore? That's correct. So majority of you guys answered correctly. This is all the quiz questions for today. We have last question for you. If you can let us know, will you be able to apply what you have learned today from this session? and leave any comments you may have. Um, this helps to plan for our future webinars. But I wanted to thank Dr. Moore uh, for joining us today. This has been a credible presentation.